When postmodern philosophy is talked about by theologians, you can often get some very polarised reactions. Some say you ought to keep it at arm's length. Others say it's literally of the devil. Postmodernism, broadly understood, has dispensed with truth and replaced it with truths. Some take this as liberating, even for Christian endeavours. I take it to be very bad news, philosophically, ethically, apologetically and theologically. The fear, of course, is that if postmodern philosophy undermines any claim to truth that theology or philosophy wishes to make, it's argued that this will just lead to rampant relativism. Now earlier on I suggested that some people literally see this as demonic. Some years ago I conducted a fascinating interview with a world-renowned apologist and philosopher William Lane Craig, who has spent most of his career defending Christian orthodoxy against atheism in high-profile public debate. And when I asked him about postmodernity, this is what he had to say. In fact, I think that postmodernism is probably the most clever deception that Satan has yet devised. He says to us, uh, modernism is dead. You don't have to worry about it anymore. It's dead and gone. Forget about it. And meanwhile, modernism, pretending to be dead, comes back around in the guise of a fancy new masquerade called postmodernism. And Satan says, oh, your old arguments in apologetic won't work against this new challenger. Lay them aside. Uh, they no longer work. Just share your narrative. And so we voluntarily lay aside our best weapons of logic and argument and evidence and are tricked into succumbing to secularism and modernism in the guise of this postmodernist challenge. And if we do that, I think the result will be catastrophic for the church. Now, at one level, one could understand this concern. If there's any field we're wanting to study where we want to say there's a question of truth at stake, then a philosophy that's going to say one interpretation is no better than another, or anything goes, is going to sound pretty threatening. And some statements by philosophers who want to promote a postmodern perspective sometimes vindicate this. One of the most vivid expressions of the postmodern condition I've come across does give a pretty negative impression. In our postmodern relativistic age, we find ourselves adrift in a sea of stories that cannot be fathomed, nor anchor found. For we find ourselves in a world without certainties, without a fixed framework of belief, without truth, without decidable meaning. We have no right or wrong actions, but a series of explanations for behaviour. We have no body of knowledge, but a range of alternative cultural descriptions. So we are lost. Lost in a world that has no map. Not because it's been mislaid or forgotten, but because we can no longer imagine how such a map could be constructed. But as far as religious faith is concerned, there is another reaction that's worth considering. In a recent lecture, I heard it suggested that where the new atheists are pushing religious faith out of the public square for being irrational, postmodern theories, it was suggested, are actually opening up an intellectual space for religious belief. There's even been talk about a religious turn in postmodern theory and continental philosophy. For when examining the current state of theology, philosophy of religion and contemporary religious thought and practice, the futurist championed by the secularist has given way to a new post-secular understanding and the return of religion. The return of religion is transmitted not by theologians or religious leaders, but by those philosophers and cultural theorists who heretofore had little or no expressed interest in religious or theological questions. Now I want us to examine in what way postmodern theorists are doing this. In other words, in what way are they questioning modernity in order to make room for faith? But I also want to argue that this radical philosophy can inspire re-examination of Christian beliefs about God and the world. I want to do this by looking at three major philosophical influences that have been hugely important for what we might loosely call postmodern thought. Now, postmodern literature is infamous for some pretty dense material. I recently heard someone describe their position in this terminology. 
I will do my best to try and avoid that kind of terminology and rely as much as we can on illustration. If you're fond of hill walking, you probably know the experience of getting to the top of your climb. If it's a high enough peak, you can feel like you're literally on top of the world, with everything laid out before you. You've left behind all that constrained and restricted you on the climb up. The narrow valleys and the gorges, the dark overhanging rocks, the mist and the fog. In contrast to that, you now have a bird's eye point of view. Or if you're really accelerated, a God's eye point of view. Intellectually speaking, the story goes that this experience is what the philosophers of the Enlightenment were striving for. They were determined to climb out of what have restricted and limited their horizons in the past. To rise themselves above the narrow traditions and prejudices that they'd inherited. Those limited horizons that had constrained their thought and understanding. They were wanting to have an objective view on the world, free from any narrow perspective. In fact, a view from nowhere, as it's sometimes been called. And for the Enlightenment thought, this meant demolishing and sweeping away the past in terms of the knowledge they'd inherited. As Descartes famously wrote, some years ago I was struck by the large number of falsehoods I had accepted as true in my childhood, and by the highly doubtful nature of the whole edifice that I had subsequently based on them. I realised that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and start again right from the foundations if I wanted to establish anything at all in the sciences that were stable and likely to last. One writer on John Locke, the founding father of the English Enlightenment, puts it like this. Whereas tradition had been once regarded and treated as a repository of wisdom, Locke unwaveringly saw it as a source of error and vice. So, we must liberate ourselves from the grip of unexamined tradition and allegiance to unquestioned authority, coolly assessing the tenability of every tradition and authority from outside all tradition and authorities. The counterpart to Locke's attack on tradition was his celebration of the sovereign individual, freed from distorting passion and principle. Some have suggested it wasn't just the limited cultural and historical horizons they're wanting to be freed from, but rather it was embodiment itself. Descartes philosophy being seen as a classic example of this, with the disembodied mind being seen as the final arbiter of truth. The relationship between us and the world then is seen as an immaterial human subject, holding as it were at arm's length a material object. One writer suggested that this represents human beings primarily as brains on sticks. Whereas in other ages, humans experience themselves as belonging within a world, they have now come to understand themselves as subjects confronting the world as an object, positioned over and against them. A famous critique of this Enlightenment ideal comes from the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, and particularly from his work Being and Time one of the most influential works for 20th century continental philosophy. Heidegger takes that Enlightenment ideal and turns it on his head. Rather than starting our knowledge from a distance, or as it were, from being raised above it, it starts with our embeddedness in our surroundings. Heidegger insists that it's actually our practical acquaintance with our surroundings is where knowledge starts. Before we ever objectify something, or hold that thing at arm's length. Heidegger is insisting that rather than starting from above, like the Enlightenment wanted to, we start, as it were, from below, with a pre-reflective understanding of the way the world is. This everyday way in which things have been interpreted is one into which we have been thrown in the first instance, with never the possibility of extraction. In it, out of it, and against it, all genuine understanding, interpreting and communicating are performed. Now Heidegger's critique of this Enlightenment ideal of total objectivity has inspired many others to highlight the history, the culture, the tradition, the language we're all embedded in and rely on for any understanding. This insistence on human embeddedness in culture, language, tradition finds support in a broad variety of philosophical perspectives. For a long time now, Gadamer and his disciples have been involved in unmasking the worldless, 
traditionalist, Cartesian subject of the Enlightenment, with its truncated understanding of historicity, tradition and the nature of interpretation. Gadamer himself developed many of the themes first broached by Martin Heidegger in Being and Time. But why is that Enlightenment ideal seen as naive? Would it not be wise to rise above those limited horizons and perspectives we've grown up with, with their prejudices, with their pre-understandings, with their presuppositions? Well, every time we go to understand anything, particularly if it's something new, do we not have to draw on some prior experience, some pre-understanding, in order to make sense of it? If we come to the world with an empty head, without any prior experience or prior understanding, what sense can we make of anything? Whenever something is interpreted as something, the interpretation will be founded essentially upon forehaving, foresight and foreconception. An interpretation is never a presuppositionless apprehending of something presented to us. A classic example of this comes to us from what's called hermeneutics, which is a science of interpretation. And it's where this tradition in philosophy gets its name, philosophical hermeneutics. See, whenever we come to a text, particularly if it's unfamiliar to us, let's say it's from a different time, a different culture, a different place, are we not thrown back on some prior understanding, some prior experience to make sense of this new text? Do we not have to stretch the familiar to interpret the unfamiliar? When one wants an extreme example of the unfamiliar, Star Trek is always a good place to start. Now let's imagine that those who live on planet Vulcan, like Dr Spock, are not just controlling their emotions, but have no emotions at all. They don't know what it is to love or to hate, what it is to be passionate about anything. It's not just illogical, it's literally outside of their experience. But in their effort to understand the humans they meet, they ask to read our literature. So amongst other classics, we supply them with the complete works of Shakespeare. Every page is expressing the highs and lows of human emotion. How on earth, or how on Vulcan more to the point, can someone like Dr Spock, with no pre-understanding or experience of these passions, make any sense of the text? He has nothing to go on in order to make sense of what he's reading about, and consequently has no hope of understanding it. We could never enter into any understanding of a text unless there was at least some minimum of common ground between ourselves and the text. If it did not link up at any point with our experience, we could make nothing of it. This link is a matter of the interpreter's pre-understanding. So the idea of starting from nowhere as some disembodied human subject, without any pre-understanding, without any inherited tradition of interpretation, without any common culture of comprehension, does seem surely pretty naive. Of course, on this model, it's very difficult to see how you could ever get to objectivity, that God's eye point of view. Surely the best you're going to get is a variety of interpretations, never the unvarnished objective truth. Now, understandably, as we've already seen, some philosophers and theologians will argue that this just leads to rampant relativism. But I want to argue that it raises, in a very radical way, some fundamental theological questions. Questions like, who on earth do we think we are? For example, can these postmodern insights be seen as a corrective to human hubris? Is there not something wrong with desiring a God's eye point of view and denying our theological status as dependent, limited creatures? Should we not be celebrating this corrective to enlightenment hubris. Christians should be relativists of a sort, precisely because of the biblical understanding of creation and creaturehood. The picture of knowledge bequeathed to us by the enlightenment is a forthright denial of our dependence, and it yields a godlike picture of human reason. I think relativists might have something to teach us about what it means to be a creature. There might even be something rather Gnostic and heretical in the failure to own up to contingency. Smith believes that we will never understand ourselves theologically if we just think in terms of brains on sticks. Advertisements, for example, have given up treating us just as thinking things. They don't just give us a list anymore 
of what the product will do. Rather, they try and capture our imagination. They paint a picture of what life would be like if you had their product. They bypass our brains and try and talk to our desires. They don't just say, this will be useful, but they want us to be passionate about the product. And Smith thinks this is also true of the Christian faith. It's as much about desire as it is about cognitive thinking and understanding. And he believes that, consequently, Heidegger and some of the philosophers we've been looking at have a lot to teach us in this regard. Heidegger made a critical move. He shifted the centre of gravity of the human person from the cognitive to the non-cognitive, from the head to something like the heart, from the cerebral regions of the mind to the more effective regions of the body. For Heidegger, we might say, I don't think my way through the world, I feel my way around it. With this shift, Heidegger began to articulate an anthropology that was an alternative to the cognitive paradigms that had dominated the scene up to that point. I want you to imagine that you own a shop. Now, this shop specialises in games. You've got all the familiar games there, like Monopoly, chess, draughts. You've also got the children's games like Pictionary and like Twister. And one day, a gentleman, smart-looking gentleman, enters into your shop, looks around all the games, observes them all, questions, asks questions about them, and then says to you, do you have a rule book or a set of rules? Singular. And understandably, you say, well, which game are we talking about? Looking at all the variety of games, which game are you wanting the rule book for? But he looks at you as if he's never thought about that. So you do your best to explain. You say, well, look, each of these games have different values, different goals, different ideas of what fun is. As you enter into these different games, those set of values determine what's going on. So each game has consequently got to have a different set of rules because they're so diverse and they're so different. So it doesn't really make much sense to say, I want one set of rules for such a diversity of different games. But strangely, it did seem to make sense to the philosophers in modernity that wanted to find a set of rational standards or rules that we all had to abide by. Whatever game we were playing, whether we were contemplating the ethical life, practicing religion, ordering society, embarking on a new scientific experiment, as if they had not picked up on the idea that the different games we play in life may need different rules. The 20th century philosopher Wittgenstein started his philosophical work thinking in terms of finding such a universal rule. Later in life, he saw, as he puts it, that there are many forms of life that we're involved in, each with its own particular language and grammar, what he describes as language games. And like the games we started with, each has its own distinctive logic, rationale, and consequently set of rules. To try and find some universal philosophy that could make sense of all these different forms of life was ridiculous. As ridiculous as the man walking into the game shop and wanting one rule book for no particular game or for all the games. Consequently, there are multiple games, each with their own internal rules of consistency and meaning, each of which serve a different end. On that telling, it would be a mistake to try and translate or reduce one game to the others. Now the philosopher who first wrote about postmodernity, that being Lyotard, takes up Wittgenstein's insight about the diversity of discourse and contrasts it with what's been going on in modernity. He observes that many forms of modern thought became fixated with finding some overall rational scheme, some vast story that gives a comprehensive explanation of what's what. He calls this a meta-narrative. Leotard sees that this philosophical goal can be oppressive. He observes how this has often been used to suppress and marginalise whatever did not conform to it. Consequently, this leads postmodern philosophers to a rejection of such totalising perspectives. The idea that we must all conform to some global rational standard, all play by the same rules. What we then seem to be left with is a diversity of different perspectives that cannot be judged by some higher universal standard. 
So to sum up, postmodernists show that reason is fragmented into a multiplicity of conflicting discourses. They claim that no single universal decision procedure is operating within the different discourses. They note that the assumption of a common rationality has often been used to silence minorities. Now some of course will see the spectre of relativism lurking on the horizon. But could this not this philosophy also be seen as liberating for religion? Has not religion suffered from being marginalised from modernity? Hasn't it been driven out of the public square as irrational? Hasn't it been told, well, the only way it can be taken seriously, if it lives up to the standards of modernity, those scientific standards? But now those standards have been called into question. Cannot religious faith be seen as a distinct form of life, with its own rationality? Rather than having to live up to the standards of modernity, can it not now be true to itself? Understandably, this logic has inspired a number of postmodern theologies. One influential example is that of post-liberalism. The key work of post-liberalism was Limbeck's book, The Nature of Doctrine. Limbeck stated that Wittgenstein has served as a major stimulus in my thinking, and like him, develops a view of religion as comparable to a set of language games correlated with a form of life. So for Limbeck, a religion can be viewed as a kind of cultural or linguistic framework or medium that shapes the entirety of life and thought. Like Wittgenstein's language games, religion, as seen in these terms, can play by its own rules, does not have to conform to some external criterion. It does not have to justify its beliefs at the bar of some so-called universal reason. Now the debate about whether this approach does justice to the nature of faith continues. But there is no doubt that the theological reflection that Wittgenstein's latter work inspired has been hugely influential in contemporary theology and philosophy of religion. When giving an introduction to postmodern thought, you can't really go that far without mentioning the term deconstruction. Now, deconstruction is associated with the post-structuralist French philosopher Jacques Derrida. Now Derrida from the very beginning was involved in a very close reading of classic Western philosophical texts. Those texts often claim that there was some philosophical fulcrum, some foundational experience, some insight that could be used to base or to unify their philosophical programme. This for Plato may be some recollection of eternal forms that lie behind the transitory world or for other classical philosophers, it may be some direct encounter with the absolute. In modern philosophy, it may be Descartes' unquestioned starting point in our thinking, or for other philosophers, some unmediated contact with empirical reality. But Derrida's reading exposes the fact that for all these philosophies of the West, there is no innocent, pristine, untainted foundational starting point or philosophical center that can give the system complete coherence. He deconstructs these philosophies from within by showing how easily they can unravel. It often reminds me of knitting that hasn't been fully finished. As the knitting goes on, you can see some wonderful pattern, some wonderful design emerging. But before it's all tied up and sewn up, there are still loose ends. And if you're nasty enough and you pull one of those loose ends, you can see the whole thing unravel from within. Derrida, in a sense, is doing that with classic Western texts. He's finding those loose ends and showing how easily, once you start pulling them, the whole thing deconstructs. For example, Derrida questions those who think that we can build a philosophy on a direct encounter with the world, that we can know its pure presence. Surely as soon as we put that experience into words, in order to make it meaningful, we have become one removed from what we wanted to achieve. Also, the language that we use cannot be isolated from the wider web of meaning that makes language work. There can never be a fully coherent, autonomous identity or idea that has full presence or meaning in and of itself. Derrida argues that everything we encounter in the world, material objects as well as ideas, is always already embedded in language and thought. There is no way of getting outside language to some deeper reality in other words, there is nothing outside the text. Again, Derrida can be seen as liberating here, for those dominant philosophies that he's unpicked and unravelled have often excluded and marginalised all that does not fit their criteria, 
and frequently, of course, this has included religious faith. For Derrida, the dominating paradigm of Western thought had made religious faith seem increasingly implausible, if not seemingly impossible. Derrida made his name through deconstructing this dominant philosophical framework that he believed had oppressed and excluded any faith or philosophy that would not conform. So, as the postmodern philosopher John Caputo explains, what modern Western philosophy had deemed impossible was seen as possible again. The windows were being opened up in the world, allowing various lights other than that of pure reason. The light of faith, life of grace, the play of art, the possibility of the things that the Enlightenment thought impossible. New possibilities for religion and theology were about to emerge. So religion has returned, even among avant-garde intellectuals who have given it a new legitimacy by discrediting the discreditors, suspecting the suspectors, doubting the doubters and unmasking the unmaskers. After this deconstruction, the postmodern philosopher John Caputo sees two kinds of postmodern continental philosophy of religion, or we could say two kinds of theology. We've already seen that one sees this critique of the Enlightenment project as dismantling something that's oppressive to religious faith. And now with that gone, it can be true to itself and establish its ancient orthodoxy again. In this case, postmodern theory leaves the field open for confessional theology, for religious belief in the god of classical metaphysical theology, by casting doubt on the metaphysical presuppositions of atheism. However, as Caputo complains, this often involves the re-establishment of metaphysical claims that are associated with classical theology. And in this way, theology is seen to have a stake in the Western philosophical tradition that Heidegger and Derrida have wanted to critique. For Christianity in the past has adopted the philosophies of Plato and Aristotle, amongst others, and seen God in their philosophical and metaphysical terms, the Christian God becoming the God of the philosophers. And in this way, it had become part of what Heidegger calls ontotheology, by which he means seeing God as the governing principle of some great philosophical system, as its first cause or ontological absolute. But we have seen such grand unifying theories are the very thing that postmodern thought is suspicious of. On this reckoning, if theology is to survive, it needs to move beyond metaphysics, to become post-metaphysical, to be freed from what Heidegger describes as ontotheology, to be freed from any association with classical Western thought. As Caputo puts it, in denying that there is a metaphysical disproof for the existence of a being called God, I do not draw the conclusion that it is now safe to have faith in the old metaphysics, but the radical conclusion that this God requires a rethinking. But what kind of talk of God can survive this critique of classical theology? Well, many suggestions have been made, but one of the most radical can be found in the writings of Derrida himself. Derrida is quite clear in what he is rejecting. As he writes, we should stop thinking about God as someone over there, way up there, transcendent. What is more into the bargain, capable of more than any other satellite orbiting in space, of seeing into the most secret of the most interior places? It is perhaps necessary, if we are to follow the traditional Judo-Christian Islamic injunction, to think of God and of the name of God without such idolatrous stereotyping or representation. It is not so clear, though, what this ontotheology is being replaced with. What Derrida has in mind has been described in various ways. The other beyond being, the unconditional without sovereignty, the impossible gift, the holy other. John Caputo, though, has famously developed some of Derrida's enigmatic suggestions and can talk about a theology of the event. One way to put what radical or postmodern theology means is to say that it is a theology of the event. In terms of their temporality, events never being present solicit us from afar, draw us on, draw us out into the future, call us hither. Events are provocations and promises, and they have the structure of what Derrida calls the unforeseeable to come. The name of God shelters an event. The name of God is very simply the most famous and richest name we have to signify both an open-ended excess 
and an inaccessible mystery. Understandably, the jury is still out on whether this radical postmodern theology does justice to religious faith and its historical traditions. As one commentator on Darada's influence on theology states, uncertainty surrounds Darada's use of religious motives. Do they offer a constructive alternative to a theology still dominated by metaphysics of presence, certainty and totality? Or do they corrode the truth of religion from within, emptying it of all particular content and driving its adherents into the desert of nihilism? Is Darada just dressing up his atheism in religious garb? As we saw at the beginning, many people would like to stick a pretty big philosophical and theological health warning over this kind of postmodern theorising, suggesting that any engagement with it whatsoever will lead to a kind of incoherent relativism. But I hope we've seen that it can open up, in some new and interesting ways, the relationship between faith and thought, and can ask some pretty radical questions about who do we think we are, and what our relationship to the world is, and in the process, raise some critical issues about the nature of faith and its talk.